Welcome to uh, a very interesting conversation I'm going to have with uh, Dr. Tony Nader. Uh, he's head of the Maharishi organization worldwide. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, let me just tell you a little bit about Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who I'm personally indebted to because I learned transcendental meditation from him. I learned a whole lot about the Vedic culture, the Vedic heritage, many, many things that uh, he brought to the Western world for Western people to understand. He brought it from India in an extremely authentic way, not digesting it into an anglicized, westernized version, but always demanding and insisting that all his Western followers should become extremely loyal to the Indian tradition, using Sanskrit terms and using the, uh, the original frameworks in which these, this knowledge was uh, transmitted. So uh, that, that, that Maharishi's organization became one of the pioneers bringing Vedic civilization to the attention of the world in, in the modern era. Uh, and uh, I will be asking uh, Dr. Nader to give a little introduction to what all they are doing these days. But suffice it to say that I'm, I, I had a personal, I have had a personal connection since I was a teenager and I have, uh, I continue to practice transcendental meditation. Uh, and the, the Maharishi organization has been very generous uh, to, uh, to me. They've uh, invited me a few times to their campus here in the US. Uh, I, I have a lot of good friends there. and They're, they're always there to help me out. So uh, with that little introduction, I want to say that Dr. Nader uh, has, been, has been the head of the organization since Maharishi left. And uh, welcome Dr. Nader to the show. And would you like to say a few words about the organization? Thank you very much. First, it's great to be with you again. <clears throat> I've had the honor and pleasure to have more discussions with you. And it has always been very inspiring. The organization is <clears throat> active in teaching transcendental meditation and its advanced techniques. It is active in research, in science, uh, showing the effectiveness of these techniques in promoting individual health, well-being, behavior, and even social aspects of life, which is something very important that we have discovered already in the 1960s, early 70s mainly, where Maharishi had predicted that a small percentage of people who practice these technologies of consciousness together, they can have an influence not only on themselves individually, but also on society. And that leads to decrease in crime, decrease in hospital admission, a decrease in infant mortality, a decrease in accidents of the road, and many other positive factors. And so at this time when the world is going through some turbulence, uh, we felt the uh, necessity to get this knowledge out and actually demonstrate it again, because it has been demonstrated through many scientific research studies before, so there is this social effect uh, from individual consciousness to group consciousness through that to the social consciousness or what we call collective consciousness and improving behavior in society as a whole. We have our university that had the pleasure and honor to have your visit in Iowa. We are in many centers. We have many clinics, health clinics based on Ayurvedic knowledge, Ayurvedic medicine. And of course, with using also integrated diagnostics and other techniques. And we have centers in 150 countries in the world uh, and in almost every major city around the world, spreading and teaching transcendental meditation. And we have recently in the past four years uh, created an app that helps in the teaching also so that the teaching itself is, as you said, very traditional. We actually go through a proper puja before we give the proper mantras and uh, we keep the teaching very very systematic and we call this the purity of the teaching and i'm really glad that you alluded to that importance because the knowledge comes from thousands of years old and marishi has very very keen and very um, uh, re requiring all of us all the teachers to follow the procedures as, as they have been taught in the vedic ancient vedic tradition for thousands of years this is this is excellent. You know, um, one of the uh, one of the major areas of my uh, intellectual intervention in the West, because I've lived here for fifty five years now, almost. Uh, uh, you know, I came here as a young man, but I've lived here. I go back to India three four times a year, so I'm connected with both. 
uh, one of my major areas of work has been the a critique of how many people who brought Indian knowledge to the West started digesting it. And I'll explain the word digesting it into Western frameworks, Western paradigms, uh, you know, in order to be more popular or in order to be fashionable or maybe to claim originality. And they lost the authenticity. And I always cite Maharishi as a counter example that he kept the authenticity. He, he, he was very traditional. He wanted to make sure that the correct Sanskrit words are used so that the knowledge stays pure and it doesn't get mixed up with many other things. And, and, and in that regard, the, 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 the decision and the strategy to remain non-digested, undigested, if you will, uh, is quite unique to Maharishi. And it takes audacity. It takes courage. I think he was way ahead of his time. And I also want users to, readers to, or viewers to know that Maharishi was the first to bring Ayurveda. I mean, he brought some very experts uh, from India to start this in the United States. And then, of course, many other people started Ayurveda in this country. He also brought Jyotish. He was very, uh, you know, strong on that. So uh, the, the, the whole complex of Vedic culture uh, uh, he brought uh, as, a, as a, a totality, uh, including, as you said, the uh, social impact on uh, of, of meditation on society now here i want to uh, but before we get into the questions i want to uh, i want you to tell the viewers uh, your recent trip to india your you you did some important things and i i read about them but i think people should know why you went what you did and why that was important uh, <clears throat> again it's because the world situation is as it is as we know today <clears throat> And our understanding <coughs> is that <coughs> most of the world decisions and discussions with each other and conflict between nations is based on a world view that everything is material and physical. And therefore, you act on the material level, you act on a physical level, you grab what you can, you fight when you can on the surface, to survive to, you know, you can have many reasons and logics of why you want to do what you do, based particularly on the fact that there is an understanding that everything is physical, everything is material. So that's what we call the physicalist point of view, which means there is some physical energy that then develops into matter and matter gets more complexified into creating nervous system. And then all that we call the spiritual side, the mental side, the consciousness side, the feelings and all that are only emergent qualities, expressions of this physical material reality. Based on this assumption, there are consequences to how you behave, how you interact and what you do. The Vedic tradition as brought to light by Maharishi and as we are continuing to develop in terms of explaining it, and I have a book coming up called Consciousness is All There Is, it really is Vedantic, which means that consciousness is primary and it's consciousness that appears as matter. This has, a, as I can call it, the hard problem of physicalness, which means how does physicality emerge and why does it emerge? And this is what I address in the book. This is just as a background, but basically, when we see the situation in the world as it is today, and we see that people are seeking resolution of their issues and conflicts on the physical material level, they are forgetting that it is actually the mind that makes the decision to go into war. It is the vision and <clears throat> broadness or narrowness of vision that makes people able to see solutions or not. And therefore, the decision to fight, the decision to, to, to go into conflict, the decision for, you know, behavior and all of that comes from that field of consciousness, which is the primary field of life. And we have known and seen repeatedly through scientific research that the individual consciousness is not limited to individual body structure and that as a group we also have a consciousness. So when we are as a group stressed and tired and, and fatigued or fearful, 
the behavior of the group and in consequence the leaders of the group who make the decision is based on a narrow perspective on a narrow vision but when the group is settled and the mind is clear and consciousness is broader then the group behaves and the leaders in consequence of that behave and decide in a more creative more evolutionary more holistic way for long-term benefit rather than immediate short-term uh, access to something that seems to be a good idea but which turns out over the long term to be a very negative and harmful uh, aspect so based on the knowledge that we have which has been shown scientifically that square root of one percent of a population of any country or group or uh, region of the world is enough if they are practicing these deep transcending together particularly the advanced techniques, which we call the Siddhi program, which comes from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, then they can create an effect which is overall calming and leading to a positive response. So we had that challenge, having this knowledge, having proven it, having studied it, to actually do something for the world. And that is why we assembled uh, over 10,000 people. And the reason for the number is again based on that formula, the square root of 1%. World population is about 8.1 billion today. 1% of that is 81 million and the square root of that is 9,000. So normally 9,000 people are enough if they practice these techniques together to start creating a calming effect. And what better place to do it than the land of the Veda, the origin of this knowledge from where this technology actually comes. Uh, and so <clears throat> we all went from 139 countries uh, to India. We were welcome in the south of Hyderabad. Uh, and we had a joy to be with Daji, who is a great uh, inspired leader uh, and teacher, uh, and at the Heartfulness Center. But our people came with the knowledge and experience of practicing these advanced techniques. And we meditated there for about 14 days. By the time we settled, it was less time. And did our programs of transcending together and cre creating this effect. And one of our goals was to make this 10,000 group a permanent group not necessarily those people who have come from different countries because they had to go back home, but to inspire the Indian leaders, to inspire the spiritual leaders in India, to use that knowledge, to get to know it, and to get to experience it firsthand. And so it was extremely successful in the sense that many top spiritual leaders uh, with powerful follow following and powerful follow followers and, and practitioners and disciples come, came to visit us and to experience the feeling, to experience the atmosphere, to see the practice of these Vedic technologies. And they have actually, uh, many decided that they would like to create this 10,000 group to make a difference on the collective consciousness level of the entire world, because this number is enough to cover the square root of 1% of the world population. And therefore we hope and we expect and we are seeing already the start of this uh, permanency of such a group, which gives us great hope that the world will move in a different direction as soon as these groups are assembled together. Excellent. You know, I remember a few decades ago uh, when Maharishi was here, he uh, was doing experiments in the United States using this uh, square root of 1% principle. And he did these experiments very successfully in Washington, D.C. Crime rate did go down and in various other cities. They did a, they had the, uh, the, the scientists and the social scientists come and measure crime rate before th they did this and then the crime rate during and after. And in every single one of those cases, there was a significant drop in crime rate and violence and so on. So the technique, uh, you know, a lot of people don't, they poo poo these ideas because they're very, uh, they're kind of very uh, against spirituality. I, I say they're, they're stuck in the materialism. 
And since the materialism uh, laws cannot explain spirituality, they are very dubious. They, they find these things very kind of dubious. Uh, so, uh, but it has been proven before, and I'm glad you are reviving this, uh, and, and you, I'm glad you are brought, bringing this out in uh, in India. This is an amazing, uh, amazing uh, thing that you are achieving. So, uh, <clears throat> given that as a kind of a background, what, what, one of the comments I, I wanted to share is from my side that, you know, the Western approach for social harmony and advancement of society is sort of top down rather than starting with the individual and upgrading his consciousness through meditation, which is the Indian approach. The Western approach has been you make laws, uh, you debate in, you come up with policies, uh, you come up with, uh, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, quotas and rules and you enforce them and or, or you know, you have all these different kind of uh, you have so many different laws going on and different uh, debates going on politically on how to handle, uh, you know, different kind of uh, political problems, whether they are in foreign affairs, whether they are domestic. Uh, and, and nothing is done. Nothing is done to make the individual a better person. So uh, while the West has unprecedented success in science and technology of the external kind of the physical kind in the past 500 years, I would say that it really hasn't improved the quality of the average human being in terms of the inner being, the adhyatma, the inner inner side of a person, which requires this technology of meditation. So do you want to comment on that, 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 that uh, you know, um, we can go on, my, my position I want you to comment on, but my position is that we can go on making all kinds of progress in the social sciences. But the Western social sciences don't start with the individual. They, 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 you know, they start with society and what is wrong with society and who is at fault and uh, what is the dialectic and who are the uh, oppressors and all sorts of things like that, Marxism and so on. But very little, if anything, has been done to uh, make all people meditate from childhood, make them better people, make them calm, make them you know, have more compassion, make them have more love. And then work on society bottom up. So, would you comment on that? Absolutely. This is really fundamental and beautifully described. Um, see, it again comes back to the worldview. And this is between the reality being fundamentally at the level of consciousness, being fundamentally spiritual, or being fundamentally material and physical. And so when it's material and physical, it's just uh, <clears throat> an interaction of physical matter. And there are laws that emerge from these interactions. And then you have to force the people or whatever to act according to those laws. You know, there is a saying which says, um, when morality decreases in society, then societies and governments start to legislate more and more. So when you have to create more and more laws and more and more restrictions and more and more uh, legal uh, effects and lawyers and courts, that means you, can, you don't depend on the uh, reality of people behaving properly. So you have to force them and you have to, uh, you know, make them be afraid of the law and therefore they would not do something out of fear of the law rather than out of their nature uh, of wanting something good, wanting something right. And so that is really a key point in terms of how we approach society and we approach all various aspects in behavior, in relations, in, in decision-making, in political uh, you know, systems and all of that. Because you can imagine that any political system, any kind of law can work if the people automatically and spontaneously think and act in accordance with what is evolutionary, what is positive, what is good, what is healthy. And when you know that inside of us is the field of pure being, pure consciousness, when you come from this paradigm, which is substantial in terms of its uh, support of being a true paradigm. So it's not just some, some wishful thinking or some nice idea in order to have good results, but 
it really explains so many factors about the reality of life, the meaning of life, uh, freedom, determinism, and, and so many factors. When you understand that within every one of us is that Atma, that in infinite self, which is itself Brahman, I am Atma Brahm, this Atma is totality, is wholeness, as discovered even by physics and the objective methods of science that went to see what is the fundamental aspect of life and found that there is a unified field, which we are saying is the field of consciousness, which is who we are, know thyself, go there. And then when you go there, when we have seen people, when they transcend, which means go beyond the surface value and experience themselves, they start naturally to think and behave in a proper way. That is how uh, behavior improves. That is how, uh, you know, relations with others improve. That is how relations between nations improve from the fact of being established in the self. So it is exactly as you say, go back to yourself, to your true nature, which is unbounded, pure being, pure consciousness. And from that level, you start thinking and acting in a proper way. And that is how you can have truly peace and harmony and people acting naturally in accordance with the laws of life, the laws of nature, rather than having to be always afraid of the law and acting based on laws that are felt as if they are imposed on people and therefore trying to find ways to get out of it and trying to find ways to surround it. So uh, this is really the ultimate solution to these problems of society. And that is the gift of the Vedic tradition as brought to me, to myself and to many others, as you have said by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. So this is wonderful. Now, I think for the benefit of viewers, uh, we can introduce the term Satchitanand to describe what you just said. Satchitanand as the uh, inherent and uh, nature of each of us, uh, this uh, what we transcend and experience for ourselves, the, the higher consciousness. Now, uh, there are two aspects to it. One is uh, Satchitanand, this higher consciousness, is, is collective. It's a unified field, as you called it. Uh, it's not uh, like I'm going to become uh, uh, better, purer as a separate, isolated ego. Rajiv, and you are going to, unconnected with me and independent of me, become a separate, isolated Tony Nader. It's not like that. It's uh, when we transcend, we also give up this bodily isolation and we, uh, we experience the unity consciousness. So that's one very interesting aspect, which is different from uh, the idea of morality as taught in the social sciences, because morality basically says uh, you won't do these things, you will not do those things. Uh, if you do this, you'll get punished. If you do that, you'll get rewarded. So it's all actually how to regulate the behavior of individual egos uh, rather than transcending from that ego and experiencing the oneness. So the first point I think that you mentioned very, uh, is that uh, if we learn to transcend from this individual isolated ego, we automatically get connected and hence the social behavior, hence the collective, collective values and what we should do for each other and not mess up the environment and all that, all that becomes more natural to us. I mean, that's one thing. That's, that's one point I think that comes out of this profound philosophy. The second point is that uh, this is a bit controversial statement, but I will make it that it, it does not depend on a historical event that happened to some, some prophet somewhere long ago. It is not dependent. It is not contingent on believing in some history because I can experience it for myself. And so can you. So it's, so it's not about, you know, my history version, my version of history is correct and your version of history is incorrect. And this is what the prophet said, or that is what he said because none of us can verify it. We cannot go back in time. We were not present there. And my prophet is better than your prophet. All those fights that are happening today because of organized religions, because of the three Abrahamic religions, all being centered as history centric. They're all, I use, I coined the term history centrism to refer to the obsession with history as the path 
towards as the path for spirituality and differentiated with the Vedic tradition, which says that since each of us is Sachitanand, we have the truth, whatever Jesus experienced or whatever X or Y prophet experienced, I can experience it too. Whatever the Rishis experienced in my tradition is not unique to the Rishis. And it is not that that happened once in history and I have to understand that history and uh, obey the rules or whatever they taught because I, there's no other way and I can't experience it. It's not like that at all. So the, the, the Satchitanand versus history centrism is a very big paradigm shift and controversial because if you go to these faiths that uh, preach morality and all that and on the surface looks very similar, but if you say, listen, let's just all abandon history for a while and let's just practice right now. Let's just close our eyes and do some meditation and experience something. And let's not worry too much about what happened in history and all those fights. They don't want to go there too much because then they get dismantled. Their power structure would be destroyed. They, they'll no longer have that authoritarianism. So what do you think of these two points I've made? One is that, uh, that the, the TM and the whole transcendence takes us into the collective consciousness, the unified field. And the second point I'm making is that it, it, it gives us freedom from history. See, I, 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 I actually have been talking many times uh, for the last 30 years. Uh, uh, one of my favorite topics is freedom from history. That you guys are fighting over history, but I'm saying let's be free from history. So what do you think of these two? For, for the first point, uh, which is brilliant. I mean, all the points are brilliant, of course, and beautifully, beautifully presented. Uh, I, I would just repeat the same thing, but maybe just to have a different flavor, I would uh, add the fact that uh, the sense of self, the sense of ego, uh, will always be uh, something that you have to protect. It's part of nature that we have to protect ourselves. Uh, and if we don't protect ourselves, we cannot survive, you know, so we have to eat, we have to reproduce, we have to shelter, we have to make sure we have the comfort. So the sense of ego and self is always there and always to be protected. Where is the real difference that makes the bridge between uh, the being a social person or thinking of the environment or thinking of others, etc.? Where is the, the bridge in this? The bridge in this is not by eliminating the sense of self, but by improving the perception and the realization of what the self is and going beyond the small limited individual narrow self to find that we are that unified field as you beautifully again i am almost paraphrasing what you said as you go directly to the self of everything and everyone and that is what we call there is a unified field and this is not just some uh, kind of uh, esoteric uh, philosophical uh, idea. Physics itself has discovered that all that there is, all material values, all expressions are ultimately fields, fields of electromagnetism, weak force, strong force, gravitation. And this is the fluctuation of these fields that appear as elementary particles, which then join together to make atoms which join together to make molecules, which join together to make cells, etc. But if we go deeper and deeper, we actually found, and scientists have found, physicists have found, that these fields are more and more unified, ultimately leading to a theory of unified field, which means there is one field, only one field, that appears as different fields, and these different fields then appear as different elementary particles through their fluctuations. And those create all the infinite diversity of the universe. So ultimately, even from the most objective approach, which is physics, going into, and many Nobel Prizes have been received for this unification process. It's not like some idea, some, you know, some nice thought. It's really how it is that ultimately there is a field. Now, the jump we have to make, which is significant, but very important and essential, is that this field is a field of consciousness and that we can go to that field and experience it, which means exactly as you said, when we experience that field, we are not just experiencing the individual small self, 
the ahamkar, but we're experiencing the atma, which is the self of everything and everyone. So when you transcend, when Rajiv transcends, when Tony transcends, what do they experience? They experience the same thing. It's not, it is Tony's transcendence and it is Rajiv's transcendence. It is the one thing. We just go there and are there one and the same. And what this develops spontaneously and naturally is that sense of bigger self. So then I know intuitively, and it's not an intellectual analysis where you try to convince me to, to be nice to you or to be nice to the other. I really intuitively more and more grow in the sense of you being me and me being you, even though on the surface we have our differences, we have our different backgrounds and different interests maybe and tastes and whatever, but that is only a surface reality. The true reality of who I am and who you are is one and the same. And therefore, spontaneously, I embrace you. Spontaneously, I embrace not only you and the listeners and my humanity, but I embrace also nature because everything is that field. So I embrace my environment, I embrace the sun, the trees, the mountains, and I see them as expressions of that one field and that is the beauty of it in the sense of joining together that sense of Satchit Ananda, which is pure, unbounded consciousness, bliss, which has a quality of fulfillment. That's why it is a beautiful experience. It's not something that you have to do or that is forced on you or that is unpleasant. To the contrary, you feel a sense of expansion, of well-being, of peace and harmony which all the other belief systems and religions aim to produce and they structured in a certain way, maybe because the technologies of transcending have been kind of lost, but they created structures and they created history based on the laws of nature and the circumstances of the time and based on what they knew best to be to keep the people within a certain set of rules and regulations so that as time grows and they expand their awareness, even the interpretation of these uh, religions can be deeper, can be fuller. And as you look at them very deeply, you find some similar, very similar things. For example, uh, you, you mentioned the three big religions. It says in the Bible that humans were made in the image of God. So what does it mean? It means the whole, the whole totality is within us. In Christianity, uh, Christ says, you seek the kingdom of heaven which is within you and all else will be added unto you. In the Quran, it says, I am closer to you than your jugular vein. And all of these are actually in the essence of those uh, teachings, leading to the same Vedantic perspective that there is a one reality, unbounded reality. We can give it different names and look at it from different perspectives, but it really also points to different, uh, you know, different understanding of the relationship between one and another, between us and the environment, and puts us at a very high level of dignity as humans, which the Vedic tradition has beautifully recognized and described uh, in a wonderful way. So, History is something, local natural law, interpretations. And you see, of course, there are so many interpretations. That's why there are so many sects of each of the religions, so many belief systems, because that is based on the level of consciousness of those who interpret them and how deep they are within themselves or whether they are acting based on economical, political, social kind of conditions that requires certain decision making. So, you know, this is very good. Uh, but to drill, di drill deeper a little bit on this, uh, in practice, in practice, what has one of the, since we're talking about social, political problems and challenges and conflicts, that's also part of our uh, in, uh, mutual interest. Uh, I think a large part of the conflict that we face uh, is that even though mysticism has existed in the three Abrahamic religions in the past. Uh, it didn't uh, sort of uh, take over as the dominant view uh, 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 
the dominant view happened to be in the hands of uh, people who were into power, uh, into power, history, rules, uh, things of that sort. And, and today, today, the real test is this. Uh, can I go to a particular religion X or a particular local establishment X of whichever kind and make the proposition that, listen, there is no exclusivity claim historically because a lot of your people probably had these experiences, but a lot of my people also had these experiences. I belong to a lineage where they came up with many of these profound discoveries and they've taught me. And I respect the fact that you have a similar origin in, in your belief system, your worldview, that many great uh, you know, spiritual experiences happen. So can we agree that uh, you don't have to knock me down and I don't have to knock you down and I'm not, I'm not trying to convert you. You should not try to convert my people. Because the moment you say that there is an exclusivity of truth that only you have, and I'm not, have, uh, you know, I don't have that kind of a feature capability in me and I'm destined to hell or something and your job is to convert me and you've been given this uh, franchise. God gave you a franchise to convert everybody. You gave you an exclusive franchise to take over the world. I mean, let's get rid of that because you don't have an exclusive franchise. You do have truth. I acknowledge that. But so do I and so do everybody else. And so do the Native Americans and so do the people in Africa and wherever, Tibet, everywhere. So why don't we respect each other? And I call this the principle of mutual respect, which is actually superior to tolerance. Because tolerance, you can just tolerate somebody and say, oh, I tolerate him because it's politically correct and nice to say that, but he's going to go to hell anyway. So, you know, tolerance, tolerance I think, is not good enough. Mutual respect means, since I respect you, I have no reason to try to convert you, to try to uh, bring you down and try to knock you down. So do you think that one way out of the current predicament of tensions and violence is to promote and convince people of various faiths of this principle of mutual respect and and what has to be sacrificed is the principle of exclusivity and the principle that you have a franchise to expand the you know whether it is through uh, your violence or non-violence but your, your your ultimate goal is to kind of take over the world uh, uh, under one kind of organized structure religion uh, let's get rid of that let's get rid of the expansionism let's get rid of the exclusivity claims and let's have a mutual respect. Do you think this is the big breakthrough that the world needs? Uh, I, I'd like to take an example, a simple analogy. It's a metaphor, of course, but uh, you know, you show a white paper to two people. One is wearing yellow glasses and one is wearing red glasses. And you say, what is the color of this paper? And one will say it's yellow and the other will say it's red and you know you can you can try to explain to them in so many terms in so many ways about the glasses and all of that and if they are not able to see the glasses or to acknowledge that there are class glasses which is their prejudice their whatever exposure they have been through in their lives they're going to swear but what they see and they feel this is absolutely the truth. I mean, you see those people who are willing to kill themselves for the belief or for this or for that. Uh, and they, they in their heart are absolutely convinced uh, and they think they're doing the highest thing that they could ever do in their existence. And so, uh, whereas... What you said is from a very wise, uh, very stable perspective, the way we can make this perspective become real and actually uh, happen is to clean up the glasses. And the glasses are prejudice, they are previous beliefs that are coming from not only teachings or religion, but also exposure in life. You know, people are told you are like this, you are not like that. So you are weak in this, you are good, you are bad, you cannot do this, you can do that. And they start seeing themselves through those filters of what they have been exposed to throughout their life. So when Marishi came to the world, he felt not to enter into any conflict with anyone on the intellectual level. There are great people like yourself who talk about, you know, the necessity of seeing from a wide perspective to go beyond 
historical uh, or experiences of a specific nature. And he said, let me take the people to transcend. And then directly they will experience pure being. Directly the glasses will be cleared and they will find in their own proper religion the true message of, of uh, peace and harmony and wholeness and connectedness and oneness and transcend the surface, surface values. So how to achieve the highest of what you've beautifully described is to improve people's awareness, people's consciousness. And that is why we, we think we teach a technique without entering into the discussion even about uh, these necessities on the surface level, although knowledge itself is a great purifier, as it says, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. And that is by itself is important. That's why we are discussing, <laughs> because we want to find, you know, means and ways to enlighten people and to make them logical. But again, people won't be logical if they are seeing things through colored glasses. So basically, we are back to uh, the need for people to meditate, because that meditation is what kind of starts wiping out the glasses a little bit, deconditioning. Uh, you can get above the condition. You still have the glasses if you want. You can keep wearing them. But you know that I, can, I have the choice to go into a space where I won't have the glasses and I won't be limited by the glasses. So that way, I have my history. You have your history. But I also know that I have freedom from history when I want. I can, I can, I can live within this history, the mariada, the paramparas, the, the, the do's and don'ts, all of those rules. I can live within that and structure. Uh, and I don't have to fight it. But I know that that's not the ultimate reality. The reality is much more profound than that. And these structures have some mundane, some pur purpose. Maybe they did at one time and they're not that important. I should certainly not let history divide me and make me violent and make me, you know, bigoted and up upset at other people. So this whole identity politics is the actually the wrong way to solve problems because it's taking problems and making them more permanent and creating violence among groups. Uh, this whole business of revenge that, you know, somebody's ancestors were persecuted apparently by my ancestors or vice versa. And so as a revenge, I have to, I'm entitled to breaking the law, breaking morality, just to get out, get even with them and dismantle their structures. That, that has taken the world, has captured the, in a lot of the institutions in the world today. And I think that's very dangerous. So you need to counter that with more meditation, uh, more individual level uh, transcendence so people can experience, uh, you know, seeing things without those colored glasses. So I'm very glad that you, you, uh, you made these uh, points. So now tell me, uh, because you were in India recently, uh, uh, one final point I wanted to uh, ask you question. Uh, what do you think of the Ram Mandir? Uh, the Ram Mandir, uh, you know, for us, it's a phenomenal thing that's happened. Uh, and it's not against any other faith. It's just we are restoring uh, something very sacred for us uh, that was taken away and we just got it back. And so we're celebrating it and it, it's not to be taken as some kind of uh, attack on anyone else. But what is your view of the whole Ram Mandir uh, that we are celebrating right now? Uh, it's exactly like that, that it is, um, it is something universal and it represents the wholeness of life. Uh, when Ram came back and created uh, Ram Raj, uh, it says in the Ramayana, it says that everybody was satisfied no matter where their job is, no matter what they were doing. Rain came on time, things were balanced, everybody has peace things happened in a natural way. And in that case, it didn't separate, you know, those who believe in one thing or do, do, do one job or the other. So the symbol of Ram is the symbol of unity, that symbol of wholeness, that symbol of uh, everything coming uh, under the will of the divine and harmony is lived in a perfect way. And so Ram can be seen on different levels and uh, different layers. There is, of course, the realm of religion, 
Uh, there is also the realm of Veda, the realm of wholeness, of holistic value, which I can call the scientific realm also, who is saying that there is a unified field, that I am the incarnation of wholeness, that I represent totality, and that there is no contradiction with anyone. It's for everyone. So it is in that sense that uh, Ram is for enlightenment, for peace, for harmony, for unity, for embracing everything. Now, beyond that, there is, of course, a historical aspect of Ramayana, a historical aspect of what happened. But there is also a scientific counterpart to the Ram story and Ramayana, which I have had the honor and, and pleasure to work under Marish's guidance to see how it is actually representing the development of the human physiology even. So the Ramayana is also a story of how even one individual grows. And I have been able to find in the physiology, all the characters of the Ramayana, all the events of the Ramayana, uh, all the great things within our own human physiology. So the Rishis are there, Hanuman is there, Sita is there, their relationship, the path of Ram, as described through India, is the path of this part of the nervous system that goes through different stages. Uh, you know, the, the balancing effect between action and thinking, uh, you know, between the, the value of activity that is disconnected from wholeness and then connected it to wholeness. And so uh, I have written a book on that, and that is uh, the Ramayana and Human Physiology that shows that the Ramayana is a history of the development of life, which is a scientific uh, explanation of the laws of nature and how they develop in an individual from birth until adulthood, until uh, full uh, development of consciousness and enlightenment and unity consciousness, which is really Ramraj, where all the different parts work together in a holistic way. Like, you know, you have the liver that digests or stores food, you have the intestines that digest the food, breaks the food into pieces, but then it gets reconnected. So they seem to be working in a contradictory way, but they are actually working in a very complementary way. You know, there is the heart that pushes blood, but also receives blood. There is breathing in, there is breathing out. And all of these seem to be contradictory. If you have oxygen and you have carbon dioxide, you think, oh, they're going to fight and all that. But if everything is in perfect order, in perfect sequence, then all of these different parts, including the immune system, the hormones, and all of that, can work together to create the wholeness. So I see Ram as a representation of that wholeness of enlightenment, where different people from different even cultures, even, say, different belief systems, uh, they can contribute something. And together, if they work in harmony, they create that wholeness. And that is why I see the Ram Mandir as a symbol of wholeness, of totality, of embracing all of humanity, and not only humanity, embracing all of nature, the birds, the animals, the trees, everything is embraced in that wholeness. And so, whereas it can be a systematic religion for people who want to follow rules and regulation, and it's, it's fine, it's perfect, it is also a universal truth of embracing, of wholeness, of togetherness, of oneness with everything, individuals, human beings, as well as aspects of nature. Wonderful. So I want to say something here. In the early 90s, my guru in Mumbai, who left the body later, but my guru in Mumbai uh, prescribed very few books for people. One of them was called the Adhyatma, Adhyatmic Ramayana. The inner Ramayan, and that was a that was a kind of a the Ramayan as psychology inside uh, processes going on. Uh, in 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 and this is an old text called Adhyatmic Ramayan, and you know we were we used to sing bhajans, sing you know these spiritual songs, and I'll tell you the one Hindi song. Uh, the lines were. Ek Ram ke do do roop dikhe means one Ram I experienced as two forms. 
एक राम गुरु वन इज राम द आउटसाइड गुरु एक्सटर्नल गुरु द हिस्टोरिकल एक राम अय्या मीन्स राम विद इन मी सो वी यूज टू सिंग दिस and 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 uh, uh, it it would begin to feel, you begin to feel this way because you sing this and then you also read this adhyatmik ramayan and it tells you that you know uh, when you read the ramayan you can you can experience some of these forces and these processes and these intelligences within you and then a few years later somebody sent me your book <laughs> your book i have a copy of the of uh, uh the uh, early uh, i think it came out in the 90s sometime uh i have a original copy of that with me <laughs> and then it went out of print for a long time and i made photocopies and gave to a bunch of people i think it's back in print now uh and so what you did is take this principle of the ram within uh which the adhyatmik ramayan talks at the psychological level but not at the physiological level and i think you took it even deeper and turned it into the actual physiology metabolism the organs uh the you know the different parts of all our our, our being inside the hardware you took it down to that as a manifestation of a kind of a, a, a very intricate and very profound and wonderful a set of processes going on uh, that are all unified and the ramayan is a kind of a storytelling version of uh, this whole th thing going on so i'm so glad that you mentioned all this because i just wanted you to know that more than 30 years ago before i started the infinity foundation by the way we are celebrating our 30th anniversary this year and i want you to come for that we are going to have a big event in princeton in august and i really want you to come for that and we'll talk about it later but as i celebrate as we celebrate the 30th anniversary i'm going back in time and looking at how things started and where they were but this business of uh, adhyatma ramayan and singing this song goes even before that and so when you uh, when i saw your book i said my god this is very exciting i actually spent a lot of time reading it i i i i, I seriously studied it talked about it thought about it and it made an impact on me so i i i definitely want to uh, congratulate you and thank you so people should look up some of these books that maharishi uh, inspired other people to write also there was one on the world system as a government how to how to run a, a world government system and for a while there was a political party also natural law party which was uh, which was wanting to see if through american democracy one can create such a government maybe the country wasn't ready for it but the blueprint the templates of uh, uh, you know inspired by uh, maharishi were very innovative like the one that you you are just mentioning so i'm glad that you uh, you have this view of the ram temple and uh, ram himself lord ram himself as a universal personality a universal entity uh, beyond uh, the dogmas and the histories and uh, partitions of various religions and i think that's a very beautiful way to see this i'm very glad you feel that way a question i have at the end and maybe you if you have any more que uh, questions for me i'll be happy but a final question i have is you know maharishi's movement was very successful because of people like you westerners by birth but who really took this seriously and every time i meet uh, one of uh, any of the persons who were personally in initiated by maharishi i'm very impressed by their sincerity and their genuineness and they never betrayed him they never abandoned him they're sort of true it's become their life that's who they are my question is how how robust is this transmission to the next generation from maharishi to your generation and maybe a, a, another generation before it went fine but what do you think of the young people today and uh, <laughs> what what do you think is the future of movements like this uh, how, how what are the challenges what what, what exactly is happening now uh, to the youth i think there is a huge potential with the youth as you can see you know yoga and meditation used to be thought as esoteric and indian and all of that and religion and cult and all this 
And now we can see in the world there is such a huge interest. Everybody wants to do yoga. Everybody wants to say they are meditating. They are proud to say they are meditating. And so uh, my answer is simple, satyameva jayate. <laughs> that which is true, that which is helpful will always triumph. And we feel that we have this universal knowledge, this peaceful knowledge, this embracing knowledge that can create harmony and wholeness and allow people to live their individual life, their individual qualities and their individual laws of nature with their own feelings and languages and cultures and traditions, yet know that they are the roots of the tree, ultimately that the tree with its different branches and leaves and flowers and fruits is all nourished by the same sap and created by the same sap. And so since our knowledge is to transcend the surface, but not negate the surface, not reject it, to the contrary, transcend to that value which nourishes all the surface value. So that, as Maharishi emphasized, meditation is for action, is for creativity. We don't have to be uh, going into, you know, life of recluse and all of that in order to live enlightenment, in order to know Satchitananda. We can do it in our daily life and be active and fulfilled in the outer value. And there is more and more scientific research that supports more and more the effects on the individual and society. And therefore, it's a solid knowledge that will be absolutely acknowledged. I have no doubt about it in my mind. Uh, but the shift of paradigm is always complicated. You know, when Copernicus and Galileo said that, uh, you know, the Earth isn't the center of the universe or the center, at least, of the solar system, and it is this uh, Earth that rotates around its axis and rotates around the sun rather than the sun rotating around the Earth, you know, people reacted in a certain way, which we know, and we don't need to comment on that. But what is interesting is that it took 300 years from the time this was actually described and with gradual, you know, Kepler and findings and all this and more astronomy and all of that. And even then, it took 300 years for this very simple thing to be accepted. So I hope we don't have to take 300 years for people to go back to the self and to know that life is Satchitananda and we can transcend and everyone can live their own special values, whatever they are based on their circumstances, their education, their culture, but know that we are all one and that life enjoys multiplicity of its own expressions and they are all expressions of the divine. And that will happen absolutely because that is the ultimate truth and ultimate truth always triumphs. Very good. So uh, I think uh, we've, had some, we've had a good conversation. Um, so should we take questions or discuss some more? Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you because, um, you know, we face so many new aspects in life uh, beyond the, the trees and the planets and the <laughs> and the animals and the humans, we now have artificial intelligence. And you have great experience in knowing all these aspects. So do you feel that, uh, is there any risks from artificial intelligence in terms of Vedic society and creating a holistic society? Or if you like that we discuss a little bit this kind of... Yeah, this, yeah, kind th of th yeah, this, is, a, this is a very good question and a very... Uh, question very I'm spending a lot of time for many years meditating on this because when I started out my career in computer science I, it was in AI but that was at a time when AI did not really exist in a in a, a, a robust way it was only a theory we used to theorize about AI one day and fantasize but it, we hadn't actually achieved it so I kept track of it all my life and now it's all happening and uh, some aspects are phenomenal very brilliant will solve many problems and some aspects are scary. So I, uh, I, I am doing a lot of philosophy of AI. AI is actually, uh, AI is triggering provocations of a philosophical kind. <clears throat> if 
artificially through implants, we can trigger different kinds of conscious responses. Uh, sort of like the electronic equivalent of LSD. <laughs> you know, what Maharishi faced was the people saying, okay, I can take a drug and feel that way. And so now it's not about uh, uh, injecting molecules of drugs, but uh, neurons, I'm making, the, making a pattern of neurons uh, give you that feeling. So the question uh, that I keep philosophizing, I keep on trying to understand, is what does it tell us about the nature of our consciousness? Because you and I say that consciousness is primary and matter is a manifestation of that. And then there are the Elon Musk and a lot of the Chinese laboratories and the Pentagon, they're doing this research on uh, how to use, uh, uh, you know, different electronics, uh, breakthroughs and AI and all of that to uh, regulate and control people's minds and people's consciousness. Initially, it will start with good things. They will not do bad things because then they will get not be permitted. They will start with good things like uh, trying to so help a person who's in, who detects suicide tendency and prevent it. Uh, maybe somebody who's going to get violent and they'll sort of intervene. Uh, maybe there's a bipolar person and he's having some episode and so they can detect the neurons and stop it. So obviously the first approved, FDA approved applications of uh, AI based uh, uh, neurology, if you will, uh, will be uh, sort of not controversial, not bad. It'll be good. Like people will say, this is, a, this is you're doing some good. But once these implants are in your head and once they become consumer products, then I think then the second stage will be entertainment. So you'll be able to have a experience, a fantasy, uh, you know, imagine something. Um, and then as it becomes more and more normal that this uh, AI induced altered state is fine. Then I think there is no way to stop that people who control the AI, the algorithm, after all, they can push the button and make something happen and push a different button and stop it from happening then this risk of uh, uh, being controlled becomes real. So I see multiple problems. One is, one is, will, I, will people be motivated to do meditation or take the easy way out, they go, go somewhere instead of taking an LSD drug, then go somewhere and say, okay, I'll buy this Elon Musk uh, program and pay them $10 a month and they'll put something and they will keep me happy uh, and keep me out of trouble. Uh, will they do that? Uh, and that will be bad for the meditation movement. And the second problem is, what about a concentration of power? We, we, we talked about how too much power structured, or, or, you know, all of that uh, kind of prevents this uh, evolution of consciousness on a global scale. And now AI may be, a, it may, may be a weapon, maybe a weapon that can be used to do this on an unprecedented large scale. So I, I have this kind of a dilemma. So I wanted to share this with you and see what do you think of this, these two issues. I think you, you have looked at it perfectly right because uh, AI can also become, as you're saying, uh, an arms race. It can be used like, how can I destroy the other? How, what is the best strategy? How can I use the weather? How can I use timing? How can I use economy and politics and move people and control people? And so what we really need um, is immediately to raise human consciousness so that as a humanity, we direct AI in the proper direction. And what this requires is broader perspective, deeper vision of the future, thinking long-term, and already knowing all these points that you have beautifully brought out and ensuring that people think and act from a settled state of consciousness, which allows us as a group, as a humanity, to guide all the instruments that come to us, in this case, AI, in the right direction. So that is why we are keen on raising collective consciousness and creating such large groups, because we feel that this is the ultimate solution raise human consciousness, raise the potential of human consciousness to the highest possible level, 
and then people will experience I am totality, I am wholeness. They'll experience unity and they will not go for uh, artificial ways of having just some experience. As you said, you know, take a drug and you feel expanded and you feel amazing, but it has so many side effects and it has creates addiction. And then you become, you know, as you indirectly alluded to, we become like the Matrix movie, you know, going yeah. into, into that state. So what we need is immediately raise the natural human consciousness. And we have in our physiology, because you mentioned also my book of Veda and Human Physiology, we have in our physiology all the dynamics of the laws of nature necessary to experience pure consciousness, to experience unity consciousness, to experience the unified field and think and act from that level to guide our human life and the life of your future generations in the right direction. Very good, very good. So I think we are at a crossroads where people who are spiritually gifted or spiritually they have, they have, they have tasted this Satchitanath need to uh, lead humanity in the right direction because AI is the biggest, most powerful uh, invention for the physicalists. We started the conversation you describing for the physicalists, the materialists, so now they have this uh, gadget, this technology, whatever you want to call it, which can do amazing things like uh, a whole new industrial revolution. Uh, and of course, this is going to create a new economy, create uh, all kind of uh, opportunities. Uh, but, it, but it allows people in the materialistic, physicalist paradigm, that worldview, to claim victory that, hey, you know, we were right. We don't need anything. We don't need to know anything about Sachit Anand to get good experience. I can just push some buttons and give you that experience. Sort of like the LSD, yeah, <laughs> LSD, LSDs of the 50s and 70s, 60s. So, you know, it means that we have been thrown another challenge and we have to become very vigilant and talk about it uh, openly when we go places. So, yeah, because, because people in society, you know, have their small goals and small perception. And they can use the media, they can use this to influence. For example, we just talked about Ram Mandir. How did you feel the Western coverage of the Ram Mandir you know, was? Was it fair? Uh, was so, it biased? Was, was it having some intention that you know, yeah. is not? So, you know, I didn't like the, that they would say, uh, mosque demolished to build Hindu temple, as if, as if there's no story behind it. I mean, I think, uh, and they know the facts. The facts are Hindus reclaim what was their spiritual, you know, space, a very profound spiritual uh, center. They reclaimed it after a few centuries of it being uh, captured, taken over and turned into a mosque. They reclaimed it. So the story doesn't begin when they destroy a mosque and make a temple. The story begins when, it begins with Ram, actually. And, and, and then it's gone through so much history, uh, including invaders coming and taking it over. So I think that the uh, Western media has been not very responsible in giving the complete uh, story, complete side of the Yeah. Story. So sometimes they, you know, unfortunately, they can use events to foment problems also. Yes, yes. And, yes, and you know, like people in India, I didn't, I was there, the Muslims, I didn't see much issues no. and problems. No. I there were imams that were happy that this happened. It's sold. It's behind us. Yes. And then you get some people who just start kind of, you should be angry. You should be upset. You should be, you know, this right. and that. Because they see it. And all of this is a question of perspective. Right. What right. is your perspective? What is your goal? And right. that is why it is very important to raise consciousness. So we don't go into such perspectives that lead to conflict and problems. And then in artificial intelligence also to misuse it in this direction of creating issues. Because you might ask the artificial intelligence, what should I do? I say, oh, why don't you foment a problem in this country and create divisions? You know, right, right. this is how you can beat them up and this is how you can do that. And so we want true intelligence, the intelligence of cosmic nature, which humans can, can get and are able to to guide all, all life in the right direction. And in this regard, do you see any other threats like 
for life, for spirituality, other than, you know, the environment, artificial intelligence, all the things we are now dealing with in the world. So, you know, I feel that the uh, social sciences have gone in the wrong direction and we need to bring them back into spirituality. Social sciences, uh, this whole critical race theory and wokeism, they've come up with this idea that the world should be divided into uh, pro uh, oppressors and oppressed. And those who are not doing well are oppressed by the rest who are doing well. And the structures of oppression are very old and they need to be dismantled. So we need to go and uh, break the laws. We need to go and uh, so it's all, almost like reverse discrimination. And much as I hate white supremacy, I also would hate black supremacy or brown supremacy or any supremacy. I think we have to rise above any supremacy and personal egos and appreciate the unity of all of us at a certain level. So the, the uh, creating a collective ego to hit back at another collective ego for things that happened in the past as a sort of a revenge, this has become very popular. It's become a very common trend all over the world. Uh, and we see some wars going on and the old scores being settled. So I think that uh, we are having a combination of two problems and the, the mixture is very dangerous. The first is this problem of identity warfare, uh, you know, where, whether it's a religious identity, whether it's a whatever kind of identity, ethnic identity, race, whatever, uh, this is getting stronger. And the second is that the role of AI to concentrate power in a few hands. Now, when you put these two together, you, I can see, you know, right now the large language models like ChatGPT are very based on English language and the algorithms have been trained on English uh, scholarship. Uh, so uh, Wikipedia, New York Times, uh, the writings of great English authors, they're not trained on Vedic thought. So if you were to if you were to ask questions, you'll get a typical Western type answer. Uh, you know, we tested when the when the chat GPT first came out. Uh, I have a team that does all these things. So we tested. Uh, we asked, uh, uh, "What is the? Uh, tell me about the relationship of uh, 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 Jesus with women." So it came it, it came back and said, I, "I don't answer those questions because I respect those people." And then the question was, uh, what was the relationship of uh, Prophet Muhammad with women? And same answer. I don't, I don't get into that. But then when the question was, what was the relationship of Sri Krishna with women? It went on saying he had these gopis, he had these affairs, he was doing this, he was a sexy guy, whatever, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, we came up with many such examples where there, there is not a symmetry of treatment of uh, the different cultures depending on the text on which the text is called big data and this is used to train the algorithms so it's like you take uh, you take three identical young people born maybe identical and you put one in a madrasa one in a convent one in a hindu ved patshala one in a maoist academy whatever three or four and you will find that because their curriculum is different they all grow up with different values so algorithms are like that and the ai has been trained right now on a very what I would call liberal Western uh, uh, training, uh, you know, data. And so I am interested in creating a Vedic AI. I am interested in creating a Vedic AI, a Sanskrit-based large language model. Of course, this will be a huge amount of money and large, big, but it'll have value because then, then the Vedic ideology and knowledge and all that will be deeply ingrained, and so it will answer questions and guide people accordingly. And I see that uh, there is always there is already a Qatari government is creating an Arabic AI. There'll be a chat uh, GPT type system, which will be trained on Arabic literature, their ideology, their religious philosophy. And the Chinese are creating Mandarin, large language model. So I see the world of ideological warfare being weaponized by AI. And so what you'll have is, depending on who owns a platform, who owns a, uh, YouTube, who owns uh, uh, Twitter and all the other platforms. And, uh, you know, they'll get to decide which AI is going to adjudicate uh, what is socially right, what is wrong, what is considered misinformation, because maybe uh, what is truth in one system is misinformation in another system. And so this is going to become a serious problem 
uh, going forward. And uh, people have to be anticipating it and be large enough to uh, rise above it and not get carried away by it. Uh, and and uh, so, but we should be conscious that this will be a problem of uh, human beings divided by uh, n their uh, different ideologies and these getting weaponized by AI. Beautiful, beautiful description. Really, in, in summary, narrow perspective of narrow vision leads to narrow outcomes that can conflict with each other. Yes. What we need is to know we are one and to see things from the most complete holistic way. So it's where, been a delight to be yeah, with you. <laughs> yeah, where, where I think we are, we, we can summarize our agreement by saying that we are for cosmic intelligence over artificial intelligence, right? Because because <laughs> cosmic intelligence is real, and and artificial intelligence is artificial. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 when somebody asks me what do you think of AI, I I, I often say you know but I like uh, I like natural cosmic intelligence more. And yeah. we should, what do we do to hand, enhance that? I mean, that's what our whole thing is about. So should we, should we take a few questions? Uh, okay, uh, Vishwajit, can you put up a few questions for Dr. Nader? So there's a question here. What are implications of Ram Mandir for Hindus and their status quo with the Indian government? Well, I think this is, this is sort of not really our topic today. Uh, we are looking at it from a consciousness point of view. But I, I would say that uh, the implications are that... Uh, uh, the government has supported it, and I believe in it's a good idea. We, every group, every faith should have its uh, spiritual, you know, heritage centers restored, and not just uh, Hindus, but every faith should have it. Uh, for Hindus, uh, this would be one of the top four or five centers in the world in terms of importance. And, you know, the Muslims have their centers in Makkah, Medina, various places. And the Christians have theirs in Vatican and various places. And Jews have theirs, the Wailing Wall and so on. And all of them are fine and special and they should be protected. What else is there? Is there a question which is more along the lines? Okay, this is, says, what is the 1% law? Is it for yogis only? So, Dr. Nader, I think this uh, square root of 1%, please, maybe somebody has more interest in that. Good. In the 1970s, uh, when people started to learn more and more transcendental meditation, it was found that in the cities where 1% of the people practice transcendental meditation, crime decreased. So scientists got very interested and they started to compare the cities. And they found even with control groups that the cities that have 1% crime reduced, whereas the other cities that did not practice the crime rates and all this were going on as before. And so we call this the Maharishi effect because Maharishi predicted that when a small percentage of people practice these technologies, there will be changes in society. And then Maharishi brought more advanced techniques, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and even the flying technique, the levitation technique. And we have found that in this case, the square root of 1% of the population is enough to create the effect. And this has been done on many, many studies that are even uh, peer reviewed and published in, in very serious journals. And there are principles in physics that when a small percentage of, for example, photons are in coherence, then all the other photons come together and that's how you create a laser beam. Right. So this small percentage of things can create a wide change. Very good. So, yeah, this is a coherence effect. It's a sort of a coherence effect uh, like lasers. So uh, is there a way that uh, uh, the viewers can participate next time it happens? In other words, in other words, is there a link we can put up here so, to our viewers all over the world saying, if you are interested in joining this, here is the program. You go to the nearest center and you have centers in over 100 countries. Go to this center nearest to you and join, learn the technique and become part of this. So is there a, is there a pr program like that? Yeah, uh, you can go to tm.org and just say where you are and uh, say your interest to learn. And you can then find the teacher who will teach you transcendental meditation. And I highly recommend that. I highly recommend that because I think it can change your life. I can vouch for this. Uh, you know, the experience of transcendence
happens and you will feel that all this we are talking about Sachita Nand and all that is no longer just talk and gobbledygook and some historical anecdote. It's not that. It's about me, myself. I can vouch for it. And it'll do, it'll, it'll make, it'll be so such a powerful experience that you will want to change your whole life. And I did mine, you know, because I felt that. And I felt that I, I cannot just go on living the old fashioned way. So I would recommend that. Any other questions? Uh, I would, okay, question is, uh, I would like to ask a question. Do we really live in a simulation called Maya and we need to wake up by meditation? So Dr. Nader, this is your question on the, on the matrix. Well, Maya is illusion and it has been interpreted that everything is an illusion. In fact, the real illusion is to think that what is physical and material is different from consciousness. Consciousness is the ultimate reality, but consciousness looking at itself from different perspectives manifests as the different aspects of life that we see. And so therefore these aspects are real, but they are not separate from consciousness. That is the real difference and how to understand that it's complex uh, logic, but not so difficult to follow. And I've written a book which is called Consciousness is All There Is that will be published this summer. I've already written one which is called uh, One Unbounded Ocean of Consciousness. You can listen to it on Audible or other uh, sound. It's published by Penguin. And uh, you can read the logic of how consciousness appears as matter but when it appears as matter, it's still real, even though it is appearing as a simple uh, object or a specific value, but this is part of consciousness also. So the physical is an expression of consciousness, and the maya is the sense that it is different, which in fact it's not. Beautiful, because I, I yes, this is exactly right. Uh, uh, the world is not an illusion, as long as you understand that the world, the physical world, is one manifestation and one aspect of consciousness, and there is more to it beyond that. It is there, it is happening, uh, but it is not all there is, and it is not the ultimate reality. So the Maya is just a false understanding of the world, not that the world itself doesn't exist, but the false understanding of it is the, is the illusion. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nader, I'm so delighted that we are having this conversation on a regular basis for now we should have. I would love to have you come to Princeton where I live and uh, be my guest and we can have more recordings here. And I would love to come and visit you in Switzerland, which maybe uh, when the weather is a little warmer, <laughs> I will I will do so. And meanwhile, all the best to the, all your colleagues in uh, Maharishi organization. I have lots of friends there and uh, thank you so much for doing this. It has been absolute joy, like always, to be with you. Such a broad vision, broad perspective, and clarity of thinking and elaborating and bringing the right points. Always a pleasure and wishing the 30th anniversary to be fulfilling. And I look forward, if the chance is there, to join you for that. Thank you so much. Namaste. Namaste.